Conversations, the Matter Podcast. I'm your host, John Harris. We're going to talk about uh, this book today, Republicrat, Confessions of a Liberal Conservative by Carl Truman. I think if he wrote it today, it would be super controversial probably, and he would have a lot of uh, attention given to this particular book. But when he wrote it in 2010, that was not the case. And so this is going to be part of a series I'm doing, and it's not sequential. It's not going to be like there's another installment tomorrow and next week. But during the course of the year, I'm going to talk about some other figures, uh, Tim Keller being one that I've talked about before. But we'll talk about um, maybe one one of his books, Generous Justice, perhaps. We'll just go through it and uh, give you some quotes and talk about it. We might talk about Stephen Nichols' book, Jesus Made in America. I'm not sure yet, but there there was a string of books that came out that when they came out in the early 2000s up until about 2015 or so, they weren't that controversial because uh, it just wasn't a fight in evangelicalism like it is today. The, the political um, political fight that's going on, of course, the underpinning this is a theological fight, really. It's not ultimately political, but, uh, but that's the form, I, I would say, that it's been taking. And that's uh, from the outside optics and the interests that are involved uh, from uh, the world's perspective. They're they tend to be more political interest. And um, of course, with everything that's happened politically, especially within the last two or three years, uh, this fight within evangelicalism has really ramped up. And so uh, uh, books like this, which once, well, today would be blamed perhaps for uh, the drift that's happening in evangelicalism, and they, they would be identified as uh, Trojan horses. At the time that they were written, they were not identified. In fact, Michael Horton, uh, endorses this book. It says on the front cover, will delight, frustrate, and encourage healthy discussions that we have needed for a long time. Um, you have, uh, interestingly enough, Michael uh, F. Bird uh, from Crossway Bible College in Australia endorsed this. For those who don't know, if you haven't been listening to this podcast for any length of time, uh, I've played some clips from Michael Bird. I've showed some tweets from Michael Bird. I mean, he is well entrenched on the left-wing side of the evangelical, if you want to even call what he believes evangelicalism, I don't even know. Uh, I played a uh, clip of him talking about, I believe the individual's name was Fleming Rutledge, but it was a um, clip with Walter Strickland at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He used to come and speak when I was a student there, and he talks in this interview, uh, you can find the clip uh, probably on my YouTube channel, there's there's some other places as well, uh, but it's for the Kingdom Diversity Department, and he says, that, well, we need the womanist perspective, essentially. So I'm going to have my students read her uh, so they can understand from a woman's perspective what the Book of Romans says. Uh, that's that's a good sample of where Michael Bird is at. And so uh, I just wanted to um, uh, let you know that as well. It's interesting to me. But uh, but we're going to go through the content of the book, not just, we're not talking about those who, we're not putting those who endorse this book on, on trial or anything. I just, I find it interesting sometimes uh, the kind of people who do endorse books and, and why they think it's worthwhile, and uh, particularly actually the introduction to this book uh, from someone who considers himself a conservative's conservative, and I'll, uh, I'll show you what he has to say in the introduction to the book. Um, but all that to say, this will be part of uh, a series that I am titling, or a theme that I am titling, Architects of a Political Third Way for Evangelicals. Architects of a Political Third Way for Evangelicals. Uh, and I, I would see Carl Truman as someone who helped lay some of this groundwork at a crucial time, 2010. This is before it was really uh, noticeable. It wasn't that popular yet, but uh, he was saying things that are now being said, and now they're at being identified at least as, oh, that's where some of this left wing, this left word drift is coming from. Now, Truman is known for right now being uh, a conservative's conservative, by people I don't think who've, who've read all of his work. They've read um, they've read his book, uh, his most popular book, I believe now, which is Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which I've read. And uh, I am going to give you some thoughts, uh, hopefully later this week on that book. Uh, probably it won't be long, but I'll, I, I have, um, there's a lot of good things I have to say about it, but I also, there's some concerns. And I, I think it would be helpful this reason I'm doing things in the order I'm doing them, I think it's helpful to do this book first, this Republic crap book, uh, just to to help. I don't know. I, I don't know why I thought that. I guess maybe to help people maybe understand that, hey, look, some of the things I might say about Rise and Triumph, the, the, it's not it's not just like I have an axe to grind with Carl Truman. Um, I'm going to bring up some other things on this podcast. I've talked about Carl Truman a number of times. Uh, I've showed you things that he said about Grove City that just seem confusing at best. 
uh, or just shielding the school uh, and the school's uh, honestly uh, poor, unwise, and wrong decisions uh, at uh, at worst. And um, commending Karen Swallow Pryor, I, I've, I've shown you things from Carl Truman that really make you scratch your head. And I've wondered for a while, because he has this reputation, well, how can this be? Well, reading this book has helped me figure out, oh, that's why. And so, uh, so we're going to talk about that. And um, he's in the, uh, I believe he's in the OPC, if I'm not mistaken, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, uh, I probably should have checked that out before I, I did this. So I've, I, I will, let me, let me see if I can uh, look that up real quick, just because I don't want to speak out of turn. I, I think he was at least part of the uh, OPC. Uh, but he teaches uh, at Grove City College, and he did teach at Westminster uh, Theological. Yes, uh, he was a pastor, actually. Let's see, ordained uh, minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So I was right about that. Okay. So uh, before we get to that, though, let's talk about this. Um, I, I want to let everyone know two things. One announcement, the Adirondack Men's Retreat with Dr. Russell Fuller is in full gear. We got a place, we got a price, and uh, I'm just going to let people know up front. I, I was planning this as something primarily for the church that I attend, but I thought, well, I'll include some people from the podcast. And what I've received has surprised me. A lot of people really want to come, and, and that could be just because there isn't a lot of this. A lot there, Men's retreats have gone the way of the dodo bird. Men's ministries have kind of uh, gone the way of the dodo bird. And um, it's also possible that uh, you know there's some, not a lot of options available for good, solid conferences. I, I saw that when I was in Texas with Joel Webb and A.D. Robles, the people that drove so many miles to, I just thought, wh why? You know, why are they, they coming so far? And um, I, I think there's just, there's a demand out there. And it hasn't really been tapped into. There, there are some quote-unquote alternatives, right? There are a few like alternative conferences, but I think one of the issues is most of the people that are platformed there, they're not naming names. They're not saying really, really outlandish uh, truths or real truths, but considered outlandish in the eyes of the world. They, they play it safe more. And so having someone like a Dr. Russell Fuller who uh, just doesn't care what people think, he cares what God thinks, and he's made that quite clear. He's he's actually has skin in the game. He's sacrificed for it. I mean, it's it's attractive. I think uh, that's a man's man. That's that's a, a man who really uh, understands what it is to sacrifice for the Lord and uh, to be tough. That's tough. Those are tough decisions. And I will tell you this. And this I don't care. If people are mad at me for it. It's just the truth. Uh, the vast majority, vast, 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 vast majority of people on the conservative, quote unquote, evangelical side. I'm not talking about. Uh, the obvious social justice warriors, I'm saying on the conservative side in evangelicalism, tend to have a problem with cowardice. It's just true. And I'm, I'm not putting much definition to that other than uh, you can see the sacrifices that Dr. Russell Fuller has made, and you can compare the, uh, what he's done and what he's been willing to say and who he's been willing to label a false teacher to um, what others are unwilling to say. And uh, it, it, there are situations, obviously, where it, it may be, especially for a, a temporary period of time, it, it may not be advisable to say certain things. I, I get all that. I'm just telling you, after years of now being in this, that's just my, my, my analysis of evangelicalism is very similar to my analysis of mainstream political parties and politics. Most of the Republicans are not very brave people. And it's the same, unfortunately. Dr. Russell Fuller is totally, uh, he, he, I mean, it, it's, I'm trying to think of a, a political figure, maybe Josh Hawley, I don't know, someone who's brave, who just does the right thing, doesn't care. Um, I don't know. But Dr. Russell Fuller is certainly uh, someone of character, and I think it's someone people want to hear from. And so I have received lots of messages from people in the Midwest, the Deep South, they want to come. And it's a bit of a sacrifice. And, and I feel I, I've been thinking about it because I thought, man, this thing is it's two nights. It's a, a, you know one full day and then there's Sunday morning and there's you know Friday afternoon. So it's, it's like two days, two nights. And I'm like, man, if people are coming that far, I want to try to see if there's something else I can do here. And I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still thinking through that. If there's something else in the area that I can plan um, as a maybe after Sunday or that, that Friday morning or something like a pre thing. I'm not sure yet. I'm thinking through that, but uh, the, the retreat itself is going to be Friday afternoon you come and Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, I guess, uh, you leave. Uh, so we'll have Sunday breakfast and then that's it. That's that's how it's planned right now. Um, Sunday, well, Sunday breakfast, we'll have a service and then th um, that's it. But um, 
gauging from some of the support that uh, has come in, or at least the interest level, uh, this may be something that we can do also in the future. And, and we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm going to see uh, what happens with the retreat. I've been given kind of the, the okay to have as many as 100 people. So I got to cap it there. I can't go over that uh, because the facilities won't allow for it. And I couldn't find facilities that were bigger. So um, so, so this could go quick. And I would just recommend go to the info section, go to the website, sign up uh, so that your name is there and you can have a guaranteed spot at the retreat. The um, deadline is October 1st. Cost is $184. You get all your meals. You got uh, two nights of sleep. Uh, I think um, uh, if, if someone, I, I've had already one person reach out. If you want to donate to this effort, and if you've wanted to donate donate to some of my efforts, but you need a 501c3, this is a good way to do it. You can donate to uh, Grace Bible Church, and I have the address there. You can just send a check to them, and uh, that will help. We, we may, if we get enough, we may just be able to even um, start to minimize the cost. And if cost is an issue, uh, that's something that you can email me privately about, and we can talk about maybe um, how to get you there and all that. But it is in the Adirondacks. So the closest airport is probably Albany, I would think, Albany Airport. And, uh, and then um, if, if you just let me know you're coming and we can try to, I can try to do my best to coordinate rides and that kind of thing. Um, it may be, it may be possible that you might have to get uh, a rental or, um, or figure out another arrangement of some kind, but I will do my utmost. I, I just give you my word on this to try to coordinate and arrange rides as much as I possibly can. Uh, there might be limitations depending on how many people come, though. So we'll figure that out as we go. But if you want to come and you you know that you can come and you're you're you know this is something that uh, you can commit to, then I would uh, commit because I think it's going to fill up pretty quick. And uh, by the way, I, I had a message from Ad Robles. Ad Robles is coming. I don't now he I don't know what I'm going to have him do yet. Uh, if anything, maybe we'll just let him relax. But uh, uh, I might have we might do like a panel thing. I don't know yet. But uh, Ad is going to be there. Uh, Dr. Russell Fuller is going to be there. Uh, we'll see who else uh, ends up coming, but it'll, it should be fun. It's in the Adirondacks. It's at Camp of the Woods in Speculator, New York, and all the instructions are there in the info section if you want uh, to sign up for this. I also want to let you know about Equipping the Persecuted. Equipping the Persecuted uh, is a ministry for Nigerian Christians that uh, helps aid them with um, uh, things that they need, so food and water and that kind of stuff, but also just equipment like bulletproof vests, body armor, that kind of thing, uh, like uh, walkie-talkies, uh, some some gear that will help protect them from terrorist attacks because that's happening an awful lot there against Christians from Muslim factions. And so um, I, it's an organization that I uh, believe in and um, I, I know the person who runs it. And so if you're looking for organizations to donate to because let's face it you were donating to crew or some other organization and they went woke and you're looking for alternatives i would suggest checking out um, equipping the persecuted their website is equipping the persecuted.org now uh, let's get into the issue at hand uh, we're going to talk about uh, this um, this book republicrat architects and my series title is architects of a political third way for evangelicals and I'm going to show you, I'm going to blow up this whole thing so you can see uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, this is, and that's Carl Truman there on the right. That's the, the book. And this came out in 2010. In fact, if you go to Amazon, I'm going to go there right now. Uh, Republicrat. It doesn't have a whole lot. Let's see here. It has 46 ratings. 46. Now, if you look up like rise and triumph of the modern self how many ratings does that have it probably has thousands let's see yeah 1641 so uh carl truman wasn't as known for this he wasn't as big of a name at, at that point but this is the book uh that that he did write and i don't know to what extent it's influenced things but it i i would be i think naive to think it hasn't influenced anything especially uh given the people on the back who have um, endorsed it in some way uh, you have a um, professor of church history at Reformed Theological Seminary, Andrew Hoffecker. Um, you have uh, Tina Moore, Dean of Breakpoint Centurions Program, Derek Thomas, uh, professor of theology at Reformed Theological Seminary. You, there's uh, Peter uh, Lilback, president of Providence Forum, author of George Washington's Sacred Fire. It's interesting that Peter Lilback, it's just interesting to me. I thought it wasn't Peter Lilback. I should probably look this up too. 
I thought he was, uh, let's see, Westminster, the president of Westminster, if I, uh, president and professor of historical theology, uh, yeah, <laughs> president, uh, at Westminster Theological Seminary, so yes, yes, uh, so yeah, there are some influential people who have heard this, and, and I, you know, this is, and Cartram is now a big name, and so I think it's important to know kind of what he believes, or at least did believe in 2010, and I think, based on things I've seen, on the, even the last year or two, uh, he probably still believes a lot of this stuff. So, um, so, so that's part of the reason we're going over it and, uh, and, and doing it before I talk about Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And uh, let's see, what else? I'm trying to think what other introductory remarks I have. Not really many, but uh, for those who don't know, uh, Carl Truman, uh, now you know. Now, here's uh, what Peter Lilback writes um, in the foreword to this particular work. He says, here is a scholar who relishes the writings of Karl Marx, but who is inherently, intrinsically, and immutably co committed to the Reformation spirit of Martin Luther and John Calvin. So I want you to, to, to think about this. A scholar who relishes the writings of Karl Marx, but inherently, instinctively, immutably committed to the Reformation spirit of Martin Luther and John Calvin. Well, isn't that what we've seen since 2000, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, and then really ramping up in 17, 18, 19, and then super ramping up in 20. Isn't that what we saw? It was people who claimed to be reformed theologically, but were somehow politically on the left. It was very confusing for a lot of people. And that's basically what Peter Lilbeck says about Carl Truman. It's like, hey, uh, you know, and Carl Truman included it in the introductions. Carl Truman's not running away from this. Yeah, re relishes the writings of Karl Marx. And, and Truman has his critiques for Marx, but still relishes the writings of Karl Marx. But hey, he's reformed theologically. And so Peter Lilbach makes this observation about Carl Truman. And it's interesting, there's even a critique of what Carl Truman writes in Peter Lilbach's endorsement, or his his uh, foreword to the book, because uh, he, he talks about how Carl Truman can overstate his case and things like that. It's just, I was like, this is kind of a weird introduction, uh, or foreword, I should say. But uh, that's uh, part of the book. And, um, and so uh, then you have, uh, what, I'm going to just give you what Carl Truman uh, says about, oh, I remember what I was thinking of. Um, let's see here. Gospel Coalition, Republicrat. I was, I was uh, trying to remember, and now it's come to my head, that uh, this book was actually highlighted at the Gospel Coalition in 2011 by none other than Kevin DeYoung. That's right. June 23rd, 2011, Kevin DeYoung talks about this book. So why don't we wait until um, maybe maybe we'll get to this if we have time at the end. Um, I'll just read for you his conclusion. This is an important, relentlessly interesting little book. Truman wants Christians to be more realistic about what politics can accomplish and how political ends are accomplished. He wants Christians to stop throwing around words like socialist, fascist, and Marxist willy-nilly. He wants Christians to show no tolerance for those who draw Hitler mustaches on Bush or turn Obama into Heath Ledger's Joker. He wants Christians to avoid making partisan politics the determination for who's in and who's out in our churches. And above all, he wants Christians to think more critically and independently about politics. To all this, I say yes and amen, even if along the way I may let out an occasional, I can't believe you just said that. So there's... Kevin DeYoung, writing for the Gospel uh, Coalition in 2011, talking about this third way book of Carl Truman's. Uh, this this book that, um, well, it's it's not, in my opinion, um, it, it's not your typical average uh, what you'd consider from politically or conservative uh, theologically people, uh, politically conservative and politically theological people, uh, because Carl Truman is politically more on the left. He has some social issues he agrees with Christians on, but even some of his logic and some of the terms he used in it and everything, but but one of the things, and, and you saw that in, in this, um, uh, this conclusion by Kevin DeYoung, one of the things you see is this kind of, this can we turn down the rhetoric kind of thing, and we've seen this at the Gospel Coalition since then. It's been used, it's been weaponized. It's If you talk about there's Marxism out there, you, you're just, you, you know, you can't, you shouldn't use those terms, and it's like, yeah, but some people are actually Marxists, right? And we've been dealing with this for years. This is in 2011, guys. It's 2011. Kevin D. Young, Carl Truman. So you, when, when you wonder, when I've wondered even, like, why isn't Carl Truman doing more? Why? Wait, how come Kevin D. Young hasn't really hit this thing out of the park? That Well, when you look back at some of the things that they wrote, not, not like that long ago. Maybe they're changing their minds on some of these things. That's perfectly acceptable, but... You know, they, they were saying things that uh, now if, if you said them, 
you would probably be categorized more easily on as being uh, friendly with the left or something like that. So anyway, um, Carl Truman complains about being categorized at the time he wrote this, but it's it's not even close to what's happening now. Uh, and and so um, let's talk about the book itself. Okay, so we talked about the Gospel Coalition, uh, and, and they they did they noticed it, but I don't know if a lot of other people did. Uh, but some I think some important influential people saw this book. Thesis and purpose. The thesis of this book that conservative Christianity does not require conservative politics or conservative cultural agendas. Okay, that's what Carl Truman says. The thesis of the book is. Um, now it's an interesting thought. You know. Conservative Christianity does not require conservative politics or conservative cultural agendas. I, I've spent whole episodes ripping stuff like that to shreds, just saying like, "Look, if you want to find a Christian, you're not gonna, never going to find a perfect political outlook." And there's the Bible doesn't have um, uh, it, it doesn't tell you everything about you know what kinds of government is the best for certain societies, and it gives you moral principles. You have to apply them. So we're never going to find a perfect political party so long as men are involved. We understand that. But if you're looking for a Christian tradition in politics, then the paleo-conservative tradition or the Burkean conservative tradition in English and in America, England and America uh, is the closest we have to this. Uh, it rests on Christian assumptions that have made their way through tradition and time into, um, into our legal uh, systems and uh, our public mores and all that. So you, you have this already, but somehow there's a, a pretending today like, well, there's these two political views, they're both secular, Christianity transcends them, and that's it. Well, Carl Truman uh, seems to be more in, in that vein of thinking. He, he doesn't, there, there's, there isn't a relationship between conservative Christianity and conservative politics um, it, or a conservative cultural agenda. Now, of course, Carl Truman is pro-life, he is, I'm going to show you some things that maybe you'll raise your eyebrow at, but he is pro-life. He is against uh, same-sex marriage. He's pro-traditional marriage, that kind of thing. But, uh, which you would think, that's a conservative cultural agenda, isn't it? Right? I would think so. That's part of that, wouldn't it be? But he makes a statement like this. So what are we to, to take away from this? I mean, it's, it's, it's rhetoric that has been used since he's written this book by many others to try to uh, really squelch support for Trump, Christians uh, getting involved uh, too much in politics, Christian nationalism, right? All of that. And so um, I just find it interesting. He's saying this in 2010. Now he says, the primary reason why I agreed to write this book is my belief that the evangelical church in America is in danger of alienating a significant section of its people. Okay, so his thesis is, hey, look, you can be a conservative Christian. You don't have to believe in those conservative cultural agendas right? You don't have to believe in that. You don't have to be so gung-ho about, like, what would that be, I guess, marriage? I don't know. <laughs> you don't have to be gung-ho about that. Um, well, who is he appealing to? He says it right here. The reason he agreed to write the book, his belief that the evangelical church in America is in danger of alienating a significant section of its people. Well, who are those people? He says particularly young people. Through too tight a connection between conservative party politics and Christian fidelity. For example, the use of abortion, for, for example, abortion, listen to this, for example, the use of abortion as a wedge issue and as a clear dividing line between Republican and Democrat parties has the potential to kill intelligent discussion on a host of other political topics. Well, what about if the Republican Party has a platform against abortion and the Democratic Party has a platform that enshrines abortion? What, what about then? <laughs> That's what we live in. That's what we lived in even in 2010. But He's saying in 2010 that using abortion as a wedge issue, I mean, come on, that's not really for serious people. Intelligent discussion doesn't use abortion as a wedge issue. Really? I mean, is that not connected to a, a, a whole view of what life is, valuing life, where divine command comes into play? And uh, I mean, there's a, a lot of questions that get answered once you answer that basic question. And to be consistent across the board politically, if you're pro-life, there's going to be other things that you are also for and against. And in this, I, I made the point before that it's not like you have, uh, it, it, it's not like you have all these different political views out there and each individual one 
is, you know, the Democrats get this one, the Republicans get that one. And, you know, you just keep switching it up because, oh, sometimes the Democrats are Christian, sometimes Republicans are Christian. And no, there's actually a little more consistency than that. There's a more of a holistic view here. Conservatives, political conservatives, um, and, and this is changing because they're becoming progressive. Their modernity is affecting political conservatism. But uh, traditionally, paleoconservatives, right, uh, and even some of the their uh, their descendants uh, have, they are building upon or drawing from a Christian framework that applied to all kinds of things. Uh, that would include uh, their view of the economy. That would include their view of, uh, of marriage and the household and hierarchies in general and labor relationships and um, uh, school and governments uh, run healthcare and the environment. And all these things are connected foreign policy even, all these things get, are, are connected in some way. And so it's not like uh, someone who, you know, it's like, well, the Democrats, they'd be really great Christian, uh, a political option for Christians if they just took out that abortion thing. Well, if you take out the abortion thing, a lot of other things would go, is my point. It's it's uh, it's part of uh, fundamental assumptions that um, we'd have to uh, peel the onion layers back to see. But they've grown into these two different basic, two different political camps. And um, and that's changing, like I said, I think, because it's not that the Republicans are going farther right. They're just trailing along the Democrats and they're becoming more and more secularized and affected by modernity. And they're where the Democrats were in the 90s, for the most part. I mean, it's they're, they're just trailing. But, um, but there was a political philosophy. There still is a political philosophy that um, took into account Christian understandings of reality. And that's why Republicans tend to be more pro-life, or at least conservative, political conservatives tend to be more pro-life. So uh, he's saying that we got to get the kids. The kids are leaving. So how do we get them? How do we keep them? Well, the use of abortion is a wedge issue. We got to stop doing that. You know, that, that. That kills intelligent discussion. And then he says, "Is at the end. so that was at the beginning of the book. At the end of the book, he says, the identification of Christianity and its practical essence with very conservative, very conservative politics will, if left unchallenged and unchecked, drive away a generation of people who are concerned for the poor for the environment, for foreign policy issues. So there you have it. There you have it. These young people in the church, who are or could be in the church, uh, man, if they look at Christians and the Christians are, they don't have the same concern for the poor, uh, if they don't have the same concern for the environment or for foreign policy issues, then man, they'll just leave or they, they won't stick around. And that, that's going to be the end. That'll be horrible for Christianity, uh, for survival. We need to make sure that we care about those things. So... Um, th this, I mean, I've heard this so much since then, just talking about current social justice activists in the church, but here's Carl Truman in 2010, making these same kind of statements a as if the church doesn't care for the poor. I mean, look, I've pointed this out many times. It's conservative states like Mississippi that are impoverished, but give more to charity than liberal states like Massachusetts and California. It's Republicans that give more to charity than, so don't, don't give me that. Don't give me that. Um, the environment, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, the most trashiest places I've ever seen in my life are cities run by Democrats. So don't give me that, well, the, it's the Democrats that have, uh, or the liberals or something that, and conservatives just don't care for those things. Liberals do. Um, foreign policy issues. Now he's writing this 2010, so this is probably after uh, the Iraq, uh, well, this is during really the, uh, whatever that was in Iraq <laughs> and Afghanistan. Um, so so I think the young people he's probably talking about were uh, against war. Well, turn that around. We're in 2022. And now what do young people think about Ukraine and Russia? I mean, there's Ukrainian flags all over the place uh, in my neck of the woods. It's just um, it's interesting, that particular issue. But, uh, you know, that he couldn't have predicted that, I guess. That, but it, it wasn't I, I, I'm skeptical whether or not it was really it, I, I, this is more complicated than I want to get into right now, probably. But I have a skepticism that it was primarily driven by the the want the need or the the desire to go into those places was was driven by conservatives. I think that there was a um, an, an appetite to punish those or bring to justice those who had inflicted harm on our country in 9/11, and I think that opportunists. Uh, this is such an oversimplification, so I'm getting in trouble probably, no matter how I come down on this right now. But I, I started it, so I'll finish it. That opportunists uh, 
eventually at least some opportunists were able to take advantage of that spirit and then harness it to some of their own agendas and what they thought you know would be but I really I think the initial let's go in it was based on information that we had and the desire to bring to justice people who had just committed a, a heinous terrorist attack. It was not a let's go nation build. You know, no, I don't think anyone started out that way. Anyway, I, I digress from that, and I, I think that issue is a, l- a little bit funnier than the other two. Um, but uh, but but it's leftists don't seem to have a problem when it's their war. I'll just put it that way. A good reputation, he says, with outsiders is, after all, a basic New Testament requirement of church leadership. And that general principle should surely shape the attitude of all Christians in whatever sphere they find themselves. So if we don't have a good reputation as the church with Democrats, okay, Republicans and Democrats, then, man, that's bad. We So we should be able to transcend this, have a good reputation with both. Here's the thing. Jesus also said, though, that if the world hates you, it hated me first. You can't serve two masters. Uh, rejoice when you're persecuted. I mean, there's all kinds of other things in that book and examples of people who were persecuted that show us, hold on a minute. <laughs> this is the guy who liked Martin Luther, remember? It said in the beginning, in the intro, hey, he he likes Karl Marx, but he likes Martin Luther or he or he appreciates things about both. Well, Martin Luther, you know, talk about a political, uh, uh, politically, uh, uh, well, he wasn't a prisoner, but he was certainly hunted for his political views. Um, I mean, look, that's someone who didn't have a good reputation. With, have a good reputation with the papists. He can't. Like, so have a good reputation with the secular religion of social justice. Good luck. You're not going to have one. So this is wishful thinking. And in 2010, uh, maybe it seemed like you could do that more. You know, this was when Obama um, was palling around to some extent with Rick Warren. I mean, hey, we can be do this. And it's a different world now. Well, I think in 2010, those who are, I think who were able to put two and two together and look at the signs of the times, I think they were able to see this at that point. But but it's obvious now. This kind of advice from this book doesn't work today. You, there's no way. Uh, you can try your best to have a good reputation in the sense that, hey, he doesn't lie, he doesn't steal, he doesn't... His neighbors, the people who actually know him personally, which is what that's about, what he's quoting, uh, qualifications for elders... Um, the people who actually know you <laughs> know that you're an upstanding person. A little bit different than uh, we got to make sure that the Democrats uh, think well of us or something. Um, I've seen that one twisted so many times. Uh, it says the gospel cannot and must not be identified with partisan political posturing. Hmm. Partisan political posturing. What if the political posturing is we should have the right to preach the gospel? What if that's what it is? So we, we, we just want to share this message, and that becomes a political issue. Guess what? We're very close to that. Some places that's already an issue. Uh, is that partisan political posturing? What if one party says we're for it, one party says we're against it? This book is not intended as a plea for one party for or one political philosophy over another. It is rather a plea for seeing the situation as more complicated and less black and white than often uh, than is often the case in Christian circles. Now, Part of me agrees with this or likes this because I think he wants to get away from ideological thinking. At the same time, there are some there are some issues that are binary. There are, and if you you, you have to take a stand on them, uh, and you, there isn't uh, a way between you know. Okay, l- let's give it a modern example that he doesn't get into. But uh, okay, gender is fluid. Gender is fixed. There's no third way, right? There's things like that that are there. There's no way. Um, Stealing is wrong. Stealing is okay under circum- certain circumstances, right? There's, there's no third way there. Uh, so there's, there's examples of that that make their way into politics that you aren't going to, you have to, to side with the party that's going to support biblical morality. And like I've said, if you want to trace out where biblical mal- morality has influenced a political, uh, political philosophy, it's going to be in that paleoconservative tradition. By 1997, Carl Truman says, however, I had switched my allegiance to the liberal Democrats, the party of the center or perhaps center left in British politics. That is basically where I have remained. That's what he says in 2010. I don't know where he is now, but I think it's important to just let you know that's what he says about himself. This is where he's coming from. So he doesn't want to push this on people, but this is where he's at. And before that, he voted conservative. He voted for Margaret Thatcher. He talks about this, but then he thought they got too corrupt, so he's going to vote for liberal Democrats. But as we'll see, he actually agrees with a lot of their policies. So, and that's British politics. So, and, and I, uh, I would be outside of my area if I start trying to comment on British politics. But here's some good things. I want to start off with some good things. Here are some things that Carl Truman says that I just think these are actually good thoughts. These are profound. These are worth thinking about. Some of these are true. 
Here lies the heart of the problem of the new left. Once the concerns of the left shifted from material, empirical issues, hunger, thirst, nakedness, poverty, disease, to psychological categories, the door was open for everyone to become a victim and for anyone with a lobby group to make his or her issue the big one for this generation. I think that's profound. Now, this might be for Great Britain more than the United States, because I think in the United States, since the Second Great Awakening, uh, the left has been, at, at least since then, has been very ideological in our country. In other words, ideological, I talk about this in my book, Christianity and Social Justice, Religions and Conflict, which you can get, by the way, on Amazon, or you can go to worldviewconversation.com. I'll send you a signed copy. I talk about ideological thinking. Um, and to, to sum it up, it's, it's really this philosophy that... Uh, reduces everything down to some simple precepts. And so human condition isn't as important as a uh, concept and make sh making sure that concepts are applied so that looking at life and thinking, uh, reducing everything down to patriarchy or equality or, uh, I don't know, some kind of um, oppression, and then everything gets colored in that lens. And so we need to um, get rid of the police in a community because we've traced some oppression back to them or we think that we can see some oppression in the local department or, or whatever, uh, maybe nationally. And But not thinking through what are the what's the public cost of this? When you actually get rid of the police, you're, okay, things are more equal now <laughs> in your mind. But uh, just because they're more equal or because there's less oppression from the police doesn't mean someone else isn't going to come in and now the gangs run the place or the mafia and now there's more oppression and it's worse. And so thinking through the consequences and the human cost and the condition that humans go through is one thing conservatives have generally done a lot better than progressives because progressives have these innovations. Wouldn't it be nice if we could live in a world where this was the case? And sometimes it is, there have been times, less so lately, but there have been times when it's like, well, yeah, that would be nice, I guess. Uh, that can't happen though. <laughs> and this, Or we would need to take these incremental steps to get there and you're unwilling to do that. It's all about immediacy. It's got to happen now. Um, and who cares what the uh, public cost of this is? Who cares who dies along the way? You know, a couple eggs have to be cracked. Okay, so what? No, you know, we've achieved our goal. That's ideological uh, thinking. So I think now, now that everyone's gotten an education in that, I think that's what Carl Truman, though, he, he doesn't like that. He thinks things are more complicated than that. Uh, we, we don't want to... Um, we, we, we don't want to fall into that trap that either everything's an either or, that there are some things that uh, take incremental steps. There are some things that uh, are more complicated that we need to think through more deeply. And I, I would say, yes, that's good. The claim he's making is that the left at one time wasn't really that ideological. Uh, they had more uh, empirical issues, hunger, thirst, nakedness, poverty that they were concerned about. And that... Um, it wasn't just about taking some idea of equality or inclusion or, um, I don't know, uh, whatever their abstract thing is, and then imposing it. It was about looking at the needs from the ground up and then figuring out mechanisms by which to meet those needs. That's what he thinks. Now, I, I don't know if that's true. Maybe in England it is. Um, in, in the United States, I think there probably was some of that. I think uh, even some of our grandparents who were FDR voters probably were a little bit along these lines, but there was always ideologues in the mix, in America at least. Now today he says it's psychological cat categories, the door is open for everyone to become a victim and for anyone with a, a, a lobby group to make his or her issue the big one for this generation. That's what he sees as the problem with the new left versus I think what he th sees himself more as in the old left. So he's not as ideological. He's more looking at real world problems, thinking about human condition and not just applying some kind of idea to everyone that they must now all get in lockstep with. Uh, and and so that's the difference between the new and the old left in his mind. So I, I would say this is worth thinking about more. He also says, I want to ask the question, however, whether America was ever that great an exception to secularization or whether secularization can take various forms. I think it's an excellent point he has. He says, some of which ironically look rather religious at first glance. Could it be that both Britain and America are both fairly secular, but that America expresses her secularity using religious idioms, while Britain expresses hers through the abandonment of such language? That's it. I think that's a brilliant uh, thought. Um, and so he's saying that basically, why can't America become secularized, but in the process use religious language to achieve it? So that you have a secularized state, you have um, perhaps 
uh, not as much today, but just before the time Carl Truman was writing in Christian circles, and, and to some extent you still see this, this idea that America is the, almost like Israel, this chosen nation, and but it's not, the religion isn't actually about worshiping God and about what the Bible teaches. It's more about what... Uh, what, what the figures that made Amer- make it America what it is, and they become um, they become the saints almost, and and then and, and I'm I'm saying beyond hero. I mean, they get a glowing status. I mean, he gives some good examples of this actually in the book of you know painters who will put like Jesus next to like Thomas Jefferson and stuff as if they're kind of like Thomas Jefferson is just carrying out Jesus's plan for America or something, you know, stuff like that, um, and and that does exist, but. But I think he might have accidentally made a point that makes more sense today than when he wrote it in 2010. I think the social justice movement is your best example of a secularized religion. And it, I've gone to great pains in my book, Christianity and Social Justice, to outline how they even use religious language. You know, the temple of democracy. You know, they've taken these secular things and they've made them now religious. They made their own religion. They cry out to the government when there's something wrong that happens. Government's God. Uh, government will save us. Um, so I, I don't know if Carl Truman meant to make that point exactly, but I think that's that's a good point he's making, and I think it it's a precursor to what we're actually seeing. I think he's more talking about quote unquote Christian nationalism here, or what's called that today. Uh, he says another area where secular mentality impacts the church is the identification of the nation of America with God's special people, and uh, I think to some extent, like I just said, there is some truth to that. That there are people who have done that, and um, I think in the religious right that has been a problem. In the past, I've I've never really been on board with that. Uh, that I think that what makes America special, if you want to say that there's an American um, uh, uniqueness to us, is that uh, we there was a lot of Christians who lived here, and there was a lot a lot of uh, the you know not people are people, so it's not perfect, but there was a lot of um, practicing biblical principles concerning morality, and that has blessed us certainly. Uh, Proverbs gives us a lot of principles, and if we practice them, the way will go well with us. Uh, we, we will reap a blessing. And so um, it, it doesn't mean that we have a special special covenantal relationship with the Lord like Israel did. I think a lot of the Puritans believe that, but I've never really bought that. So anyway, I think Carl Truman's critiquing that to some extent, and I don't disagree with him necessarily on all that. I don't. But that's the good part. And here's what Carl Truman uh, says that makes me think, and there's a number of things, but here's one of the things he says that makes me think he's on that third way, that Tim Keller kind of third way, similar to that. Um, he says, as a, as a left adopted such concerns as gay rights and abortion as touchstone issues, those of us with strong religious convictions on these matters found ourselves essentially alienated from the parties to which our allegiance would naturally be given. The parties of the right, while representing to an extent, or at least on paper, positions on these matters, which we are comfortable, yet also represent policies in other areas where we find ourselves in fundamental disagreement. If you do not think an untrampled free market is the answer to society's ills, and if you believe there is such a thing as society and government that, as a democratically elected instrument of that society, has a role to play in health care and helping the poor, where do you turn in a world where the big issues on the left are gay marriage and a woman's rights to choose? Now, you see some straw men in this. Where does the right ever say... That I mean, there are. I'm sure there's people you can find on the political right who say this kind of stuff, and it's ridiculous. More libertarian, probably, but where do you find people who say stuff like this? An untrampled free market is the answer to society's ills. Does anyone really think that that's the answer to society? I mean, it might be the answer to some things. It might help some things, but it's it's the it's not like the ultimate answer. And he says, you know, the parties on the right, while representing to an extent, at least on paper. I mean, look at that. Like, well. They don't really represent positions on marriage and abortion. It's, it's on paper. Now, you might be right on the marriage thing, especially today as they've shifted. But on the abortion thing, uh, I mean, we just had Roe v. Wade was overturned. So, I mean, listen to that, though. And and he says, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the parties w- to which our allegiance would naturally be given on the left. That's... That's the place where Carl Truman says our allegiance would naturally be given to these parties, except for the fact that, oh, my goodness... They have abortion and gay. Listen, there's, I can't think of one thing on the left that would attract me to them. Even if, like, let's say they were pro-life and pro-traditional marriage all of a sudden, and they kept all their other positions on the border, on uh, foreign policy, on, um, uh, on, on taxation, on education, 
on critical race theory on there, there's literally is nothing I can think of on the left that I'm like, Oh yeah. Like that's the Christian way. Or like, I'd be, I'd be attracted to that if it weren't for man, they have these positions on abortion. I just can't think of that. I can't conceive of that. But Carl Truman, that's where he's at. Like, well, you know, in 2010, at least, you know, well, as long as, as they didn't have those two issues that that's where I would be. So, um, so, so this is kind of where I think in the book, th this is where he's writing from this, this perspective. And it, it comes out in the book. And he says he's not writing for a political perspective, but there you really have it. He's saying, look, I'd be on the left. I'd be on one of these left wing parties if it wasn't for the fact that they were for uh, same sex marriage and for abortion. And, and that's pretty much the position Keller has taken. That's pretty much the position of the evangelical third way, except that even that's cracking now. They're even starting to go, some of the more extreme elements are going more towards the left on abortion and uh, on, on marriage. But that's still, I think, in evangelicalism, that's still kind of like you can't do that. You're not supposed to do that. Those are two issues that you keep. But, but there's all these justifications now. You can vote Democrat as long as you rationalize it in some way and, uh, you know, think that they're going to do more to help women than the pro-lifer who's going to make abortion illegal. So that's where we're, we're heading with all this. And that's where we've headed since 2010. Now, there's also somewhat of a, I don't know what I want to call it. I just said it's an out of touchness. I don't want to really use the term elitist, but it reminds me of academics that I, uh, that I got to know <laughs> to some extent in various academic um, places of higher learning that I've been in. Uh, but he, he he kind of channels that attitude to some extent. And I, I could have given you a lot of examples. I just want to give you a few. And it makes me wonder whether or not he understands really um, just common, ordinary folks. Uh, let me give you an example here. He talks about Glenn Beck. Now, I've got my own critiques of Glenn Beck. I think Glenn Beck is terrible when it comes to certain historical things in America. I, I don't think he understands the founding to the extent that I, I would hope. I don't think he really understands Christianity. There's a lot of critiques. I turned him on the other day and I was just floored by how ignorant some of the things he was saying was. But but all that to say, Glenn Beck, um, especially during the time he's writing, 2010, I recognize that during the Obama years, Glenn Beck took some, some very hard stands against what Obama was doing and did correctly identify this is Marxism. And he took a lot of shots for it, and he was right about that. And this is what uh, Carl Truman has to say. He says, It is hard to take seriously a man who identifies Marxism with a welfare state. Marxism is actually a philosophy of history, an economic organization that sees class struggle and the movement of capital as the inevitable dynamo driving history along. The welfare state is no more in distinctively the preserve of Marxism than philosophical ignorance is distinctively the preserve of talk show hosts. Ha ha ha, right? I mean, that's, this is, it's just oozing with, with sarcasm, with, you know, Glenn Beck, you don't understand the definition of Marxism. It's a philosophy of history, an economic organization that sees, it's like, okay, you gave me a definition. Tell me how that works practically. That's what Glenn Beck's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Glenn Beck is saying, yeah, these policies, this, what Obama's doing and stuff, this is Marxism. And, and, and Carl Truman has to come in and be like, well, technically, no, it's this is the definition of Marxism. And it's like, dude, do you, where do you live? Is this academic world or is this real world? Real world, this is what Marxism would look like if someone who kind of believed in it tried to implement it. This would be one of the steps. Anyway, uh, second, the claim that a welfare state is designed to stop anyone from getting a boo-boo is nonsense. So Glenn Beck talked about the, how, how Marxists, you know, or the liberals, the left wants to try to minimize harm so much. And I mean, look, I grew up in that generation where everyone gets a trophy and uh, you know, you always have to wear a seatbelt and a helmet and don't drink from the hose anymore. And like, I, I know all about that. And that, that totally is true, even especially today. I remember when I was driving as a repairman, I saw, I literally saw the transition of kids playing outside to hardly any kids playing outside. Um, I mean, there's such a fear that kids are going to get hurt. Um, anyway, as I searched high and low on Mr. Beck's website, I could find no data to support the claim that that was indeed the intention in any of the modern development, de developed de democratic economies with a welfare state. And as far as universal health care provision goes, that's all of them, bar the USA. So in other words, we're the only ones that don't have socialized medicine is what he's saying. Third, where are these countries where the welfare state is endorsed only through the barrel of a gun? So Glenn Beck talked about 
that that's what's going to happen. That if you bring in, uh, in fact, let me let me see, see if I can just tell you what he's critiquing here. I think it would make more sense for people. Um, he says, this is what Glenn Beck said. Now we've got a choice to make. Do we choose the fundamentally tr transform America to a Marxist, spread the wealth, cradle to grave nanny state, where no one gets a boo-boo, and as we have seen in country after country, is only sustainable through the barrel of a gun, or do we come to our senses and realize that spending and taxing kills business and stop with the pensions that literally pay out 30 times what we put into them? All right, so Glenn Beck is obviously using some hyperbole there, but he's making a point to a on a popular level. And Carl Truman, it's like he misses that. Just like, oh, he doesn't use textbook definitions for Marxism. Oh, it's not, where can I find a reference that says that where anyone says that they that that's what they believe in on the left that they don't want people to get a boo-boo and i couldn't find data to support the claim that there was indeed the intention in any of the modern developed democratic economies uh well <laughs> of course they're not like going to come out and say that they're not going to say it, especially in that kind <laughs> that form we our official policy is that no one gets a boo-boo <laughs> no they're not going to say that uh third where are these countries where the welfare state is endorsed only through a barrel of a gun? As I said, we are talking here about every democratic industrialized country other than the USA, not places such as North Korea and Myanmar. Okay, so what? here's the, whether you want to use the example of a sword like Romans 13 does or barrel of a gun or whatever, force, okay, force. If you don't pay your taxes, if you don't fund the welfare state, what happens to you? Yeah force <laughs> uh you and yes in many democratic societies they've gotten rid of the the death penalty so it's probably not going to be the barrel of a gun but there's going to be uh force there's going to be social ostracization if you um if you try to oppose this stuff that's his critique of glenn beck i mean it's just i i it left me stunned a little because he keeps doing this to other he did this to bill o'reilly does this to rush limbaugh to an extent and he says this too. Let me read you another one. In the world where the mere mention in Christian circles of the Huffington Post or the Rachel Maddow show, where opinions are worn on the sleeve and open for debate, can provoke cries of horror from the Christian right, it is surprising that nobody has forged any connection between Fox News and the subtle subversion of the Simpsons. That's, that's right. The subtle subversion of the Simpsons. Now, I'm not going to argue that the Simpsons, that there wasn't some subversion there in the sense that the Simpsons showed what really a dysfunctional family and made that normative. Okay, sure. Um, but you're going to try to connect. Okay, so Fox put out the Simpsons. So therefore Fox News now has to wear that around its neck. As, it's like such a weird connection to make. When And he's trying to call it hypocrisy. Like, well, you should be mad at Fox News because the same corporation also has the Simpsons on another channel, just like you are about Rachel Maddow and the Huffington Post. It's like, what? <laughs> Uh, okay, like, I guess if we're gonna, like, start to do this, like, second degree, third degree separation stuff, then sure. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know, Carl Truman, you were at a college that had critical race theorists speak in chapel. I guess you must be all, like, come on, like, are we really gonna do this? Come on. So, I, there is a bunch of examples of that kind of stuff in this where I'm just like, does he even, like, get what common working class people like how they talk about things and what they mean by them. Like like Trump probably threw him for a complete loop because like most people understood what Trump was saying when he said things, even things that were exaggerations. They knew kind of what he, what he was getting at. But it's like if it's outside the academic speak and the precision of which academics speak, and I like precision, and I, I, I would prefer someone with precise talk other than Trump. But if, if it's outside of that, it's just like, oh, they, they are knaves or they are, you know, what, what does he say here? The uh, the ignorance is distinctively the preserve of talk show hosts. It's like, come on, really? Um, okay, well, I, just, I don't think you aren't... What, what Glenn Beck said, the, the, um, the sense in which he spoke, I, I would call it the... Um, his inclinations, his suspicions, his, uh, his gut, were actually in the right place on that, on what he said. Uh, he, he was going in the right direction. His instincts just like Trump's instincts were kind of in the right place for the most part on a lot of things. And just because they don't articulate it, you know, in, in this really precise academic fashion, they become the, uh, they become the poster children for ridicule and scorn. And, and that's something that I would have heard from 
left wing people in academia. I, I wouldn't, I, I thought, I just expected more from Carl Truman, that he would be someone who would attempt to understand more what someone like a Beck, Beck is tapping into and what he's actually saying. Um, anyway, gun control. Let's talk about some of the issues here. Gun control. While much of the political rhetoric is conservative, uh, in, in conservative religious circles focuses on abortion, one never has to scratch too far below the surface to find that a host of other biblically somewhat more ambiguous issues are susceptible to the same black and white. Christians believe this. Godless liberals believe that rhetoric. Gun control is one such issue. Several times I've heard the argument that if the right to bear arms is restricted today, they'll be locking us up without trial tomorrow. Worldwide, there is very little evidence that these two phenomena are inevitably, necessarily, and causally, causally linked. But in a narrative going right back to the founding of America in 1776, there is a strong rhetorical connection that seems almost impossible to break, mainly because arguments against it are just that, arguments, and not the kind of gripping narratives that really drive so many beliefs and convictions. So, so what he's saying is that these aren't really arguments that are being made by the pro-gun lobby or conservatives when it comes to guns. They're not really making arguments. What they're making, they're just making these appeals. They're using rhetoric. They're telling stories. That's what they're doing. And so, therefore, you can actually kind of minimize what they're saying because of that. Except that they do make arguments. They do. Uh, and every time this issue comes up, you um, it, you see on the news channels and and wherever really. I mean, it's everywhere. You see the arguments. You see both sides. Um, Carl Truman doesn't really try to understand and accurately accurately represent them. Uh, so, I mean, their arguments are that if you take the guns away from good guys, bad guys are going to still inevitably get a hold of weapons or guns. And uh, the point of allowing guns uh, is to uh, for personal protection, as well as, according to our Second Amendment, which Britain doesn't have, but according to, and it's part of our history, uh, is to um, be able to match the government if the government becomes tyrannical. That's the point of it. And so if that's your concern, then... Um, then you're going to want to keep the right to bear arms. Um, and, and of course, that has played out in some countries. Guns are taken, and the government is able to then more easily enact its tyrannies. It happened in Germany. It happened in Russia. It happens in a number of communist places. I believe Cuba that happened. I mean, it, that's one of the things that um, tyrannical totalitarian regimes tend to want to do, and it's one of their initial steps is see if they can get guns. If they can get the people's ability to defend themselves and take that, then... Uh, they can more easily take control if they have nefarious intent. And and there's another argument here that's really from a Christian perspective, and it's, it sort of flows together with the other stuff, but it's just the idea that people are responsible to defend their home, and that's part of providing to defend, not just to accrue things for family to consume, but also to defend those things. And uh, defending one's, one's land or one's place, one's people, uh, has been a hallmark of, of uh, well, it's really every civilization, but Western civilization has held up as heroes, those who do such things. And so they need an ability in our modern day to be able to do that. That means you have to have a gun in order to do that. I think it's, it's uh, it, in most places, and it, there are exceptions to this sometimes, you can arrange for other mechanisms by which you can pay a guard or something who has a gun, right? There's things you can do to protect. Sometimes you live in areas you don't need that protection as much, but um, but for m a lot of people, that's going to be something for personal protection and for their family's protection they're going to want or need. So uh, I think that Carl Truman here is, I mean, he just kind of skips over all of this and talks about, well, the, you know, like th that's just uh, trying to get scare everyone unnecessarily because they're not going to lock us up without trial tomorrow. Well, they, they might, they might not. Maybe some people do go far and say things that, but the, the reality is it's possible. It's possible. They, the government has more of an ability when the populace isn't armed. And because there's, uh, they're, they're more mismatched. Um, and there's very little evidence that these two phenomena are inevitably necessarily and causally linked. Well, it's not, do you need evidence for that? Like, like I mean, evidence is good to have, but like, I could just, you know, think about it, you could just reduce it to a very small level. Okay, like, the bully's got a bat. Um, I'm not allowed to have a bat. Who's going to win the fight, if there is a fight, right? Like, it's not, I don't know, it's like a rocket scientist to figure this stuff out. But he's he's looking down on this as, it's just, it's not logical. It's just, um, and it's biblically somewhat more ambiguous. Um, 
you know, this is something that Christians, in other words, this is something that Christians shouldn't have a hard, fast view on. Well, let me give you a hard, fast view from a Christian perspective. Fathers, husbands, you should be able to provide and protect is part of that your family. There you go. However you choose to do that, whatever mechanism you use, I will say that in our day and age and where I live, it would be impossible in my mind to do such a thing without a firearm, okay? So yes, we can have that debate. Is our firearms necessary for that? Is that we, we can talk about that surely, but that's, that's the principle that we'd be working off of. And so there, there's where Christianity comes into play in this. Carl Truman doesn't really go there. Uh, government-operated healthcare. He says, Sarah Palin's reference to death panels is a great example of st uh, story-trumping logic. It was a flourish of rhetoric with no evidence to support it, and the logic was skewed. Uh, is investing this power in the democratically elected government really worse than investing in the private insurance companies that decide which claims to honor and which to refuse? She's, he's talking about when Sarah Palin insinuated or said there would be death panels under Obamacare. He's saying, basically just excoriating her for that. He says, at least with the government, one has the chance, however slim, of throwing them out of office in a while. National health systems are not perfect, but they are far from the nightmares that have been depicted in some recent discussions about the USA. And indeed, when only one country in the entire industrialized world does not have some form of universal health care, it may just be that such systems have actually proved rather popular with the majority of the Democrat uh, democratic world's people precisely because they have proved compatible with political freedom and quite capable of delivering decent service. So what, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, most people all over the world, they think in democratic societies that having universal health care, having government-run health care is a good thing. And it seems to work quite well. And there's no death panels. And Sarah Palin is just, it, it's ridiculous what she just said, except for, and this is where I, I just, I'm going to get a little personal myself here, except for the fact that we're actually starting to see exactly what I think Sarah Palin was talking about already in our country. And we have we don't even have full-blown Obamacare, I think, what he wanted. But we, we've taken enough halfway measures that we're just about there. And uh, it's I, I actually just witnessed this with my grandfather to, to an extent, to be honest with you, because California is one of the most, the worst areas for socialized medicine in this country. And the quality has gone down significantly. Anyone who lives in an area like uh, like Los Angeles or knows exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you have uh, illegal migrants who have come in, have overburdened the healthcare system. Uh, the quality uh, has gone down. Hospitals are forced to, um, they, they shut down if they can't pay for it. Uh, you have, um, in my family, people who have gone to the hospital. My grandfather was essentially killed because of this because uh, negligence is at an all-time high. There's not an incentive or a way to really um, uh, to, hold the, uh, to, to hold people accountable in this system. When it gets tossed to the government, it is very hard to do so. And in this whole issue with the, uh, uh, the late ailment that I cannot reference on YouTube, uh, it has become almost impossible to sue for negligence if it's labeled that particular uh, disease, when, even if it's not that, even if there's a negative test for it. I mean, we're seeing this play out before our eyes. And if someone's older, uh, which, by the way, in insurance claims, if, if you're going to if you're going to take a hospital to court, let's say, because of negligence, something like that, and they're and it's an elderly person, the payout's going to be hardly anything because they're going to calculate, well, how many more years would they have lived and what income would they have made? And so it just becomes that it's such a disincentive. So, of course, there's a devaluation of people. And, and if you are incentivized for every death that you get that related to a certain certain types of diseases, um, read between the lines, people. I can't say what I want to say on YouTube. Uh, then, of course, it's, it's, it's not like a panel that you go before that has you know, a judge in a wig. It's not that. It's just naturally what happens. When you have limited resources and you have... Um, and, and there's lack of, of uh, the, when you have limited resources and you have little, little responsibility because there's no one holding anyone's feet to the fire, hardly at all. That, that's reduced at least. So uh, there's no accountability, limited resources, low accountability. Um, that's what's going to happen inevitably. And that's what happens when you have the government running healthcare because guess what it's not your elected representative who's in there making the decisions it's a bureaucracy 
It's a bureaucracy. It's not, you can't just vote those bums out. It's a lot harder to do. Carl Truman, I can't understand how naive he can be in, in this. That naive thinking. Sarah Palin had, had more accurate thinking on this than Carl Truman has on this, had on this in 2010. Carl Truman um, is thinking, well, you just, it's a dem dem democratic. That's where the accountability comes in. Yeah, not so much. You should probably read the book, Demon in, The Demon in Democracy. Really good book about how democracies can become totalitarian. Anyway, uh, that's, and I don't need to look up a bunch of stats and stuff to even show you this. This is, I think, everyone uh, who lives in a super progressive state, that's the experience they're getting. I, I live in New York right now. You don't want to go to most of the hospitals here right now. Um, and government getting its hands in things and regulating things has caused a lot of this. And it's not like it's a it's it's not like a binary choice. Again, this is what Carl Truman doesn't like is these binary choices, these simplistic choices. But then he gives them to you. So it's like either insurance companies or it's uh, the government. Well, how about something else? Why not go back to free market? So it's not insurance companies that are running everything. It's not the government that's running everything. Uh, it's people. And they're making their own decisions and there's charities that come in and if local municipalities want safety nets and things that you know but but it's really primarily religious groups charities that are the, that are the ones taking care of people um, that's how it used to be and not that long ago either so we don't have we, we basically have a form of socialized healthcare already in this country through a series of mechanisms and corporatism it's 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 a meshing of uh, these it, the, these corporations or insurance companies administer some of this stuff, which has jacked the price up too, and created barriers for people. And and of course, the barriers create shortages, um, not barriers, but um, the increased demand uh, creates shortages when people meet those barriers and then can't meet them and have to go on the dole. Uh, and and I yeah, I mean I I know people from Canada who are they come to the United States for certain procedures because hey, certain things we can get in Canada, but other things we can't. It's why there's a whole industry uh, surrounding certain kinds of surgeries popping up in the Caribbean on these islands outside of the regulations. So anyway, I, I just, I, I, it, it's amazing to me Carl Truman can say some of the things he says, but he does. So uh, let's keep going here. So we have um, that particular issue, government regulating uh, man-made climate change. On this issue, he says, I have heard climate change referred to as a religion and as a liberal conspiracy. This is interesting, partly on the grounds that it represents a strange disconnection of the creation mandate from notions of environmental stewardship. Political conservatives, politically conservative Christians, seem reluctant, even hostile with regard to any application of the notion of care for the environment. And he does this kind of thing a lot where he'll be like, well, here's what the Bible would tell us. Here's the principle from the Bible, and it's out of step with conservative political thought. Um, except it's like he doesn't even interact though with what Christians actually believe on this topic. Yes, it's not it, it's not climate change. Climate change isn't a religion. No, climate that's well, who would even phrase it that way? No, it's it's not climate change. It's environmentalism. It's using issues like the idea that there's man-made climate change as a way to bring in more government regulation. Um to extreme regulation, which would, you know, cap and trade, that kind of thing, uh, Paris Climate Accords, uh, as, as a way to do that, but um, in preference to certain animals sometimes, because uh, it's more than climate change, it's, it's all kinds of things. It's, um, we're going to uh, prioritize this particular animal rather than humans. That That's and treating them as equal or something. That's the environmentalism. And climate change uh, or global warming can go along with that. It doesn't necessarily have to, I guess, but the whole push uh, in, in environmentalist circles, like the Sierra Club and stuff, it's totally uh, religious. If you start looking at what they actually say about the environment, they, there's a Gaia thing under uh, undercurrent in a lot of this. Uh, they, they attribute um, deity uh, attributes of deity to the environment, kind of new agey, kind of Eastern uh, religion. So, so that kind of stuff does play into it. Anyway, uh, he says, this is interesting, partly on the grounds that it represents a strange disconnection of the creation mandate from notions of environmental stewardship. Well, only if you assume that it's legitimate and that, I, like there's a number of assumptions that have to be made here. One would be that global warming is actually happening. Two would be that it's man caused. Uh, you know, three would be that we can actually do something about it. Four would be that we can do some that 
um, we should we should give up our sovereignty to global uh, regulations or regulators. Um, or states should give it up to the federal, uh, the, the national government, national government should give it up to international government of some kind in order to regulate this. I mean, there's so many things here packed into this. And it's like, well, if Christians don't go along with that, well, they, they just, they don't take their environmental stewardship seriously. Well, how about this? How about maybe there's Christians like myself who are conservationists. And we do believe that we should care for the environment. We do believe um, that we should do so in a responsible fashion, but we don't believe that there's man-made global warming that is anything that can be done and there, that, that is uh, possible to correct through government action. How about that? Is that even an option? I mean, you know, at the time he wrote this, 2010, I think it was, there's a few more years ticking on Al Gore's uh, implosion clock when it would be too late to reverse the trend and we would have cities underwater. Well, we've long passed that point. Um, and, and the people who, you know, believe this stuff don't even say they believe this stuff don't even seem to obama's house in martha's vineyard uh you know why would he buy a house and put right on the ocean where you think it's going to be underwater makes no sense uh flying around in your jets all over the place i don't think even a lot of the activists who say they believe in this actually b believe um uh, uh, politicians i should say not activists actually believe that there are diehard activists who do believe it but he says christians seem reluctant even hostile with regard to any application of the notion of care for the environment that's not true it's just not true. It's just, it's, in my mind, it's just slander. So just because they won't go along with the whole global warming thing, even though there's been uh, tons of information out there showing that this either isn't true or it's very hard to determine uh, or it's impossible to figure out whether or not man can do anything about it or compared to the pollution that's going on in China, there's really, we're a drop in the bucket or, uh, I don't know, what was that university? Was it Oxford in in England, where there was that scandal of those emails that were leaked showing that this was kind of a hoax. And so even, you know, all the stuff that has happened in regard to um, this issue, the fact that scientists in the 70s were saying there's a coming ice age, and of course that wasn't true, and they, now they've switched it. And then now it's not even global warming, it's climate change. All the, and, and the solution's always been the same, more government. All these things that stack up to make someone who's working class very skeptical of this, just because they don't buy into all that, they don't care. They really just don't take their environmental stewardship seriously. I mean, that's that's the implication here. And that's Carl Truman. This isn't like this. This isn't some left winger uh, today that's writing this. That's Carl Truman uh, on abortion. He says, I myself am pro-life. Contrary to current cultural logic, my politically liberal instincts concern for the weak combined with my evangelical commitments concern for the sanctity of life to put me in precisely that camp. Nevertheless, I am suspicious of the way in which abortion debate plays out in the American political arena, where it seems to be something the right often uses as little more than a means to drum up cheap votes for its candidates. What is the actual Republican record on abortion like? Not very impressive. Is the one who votes for the pro-choice Democrat candidate really any more or less culpable on the abortion issue than the one who votes pro-life Republican? Knowing that the candidate's rhetoric will in no way be matched by any legislative action, Using abortion as a wedge issue at election time to polarize opinion will not achieve that for which Christians all along, uh, all along, the reduction and ultimate elimination of legal abortions. Well, that's a great argument that Carl Truman's making for voting for Democrats who say that they'll reduce the number of abortions without making it illegal. That's all it is. This, this is, and especially in 2022, this is dumb logic. We, Roe v. Wade was just overturned. Because guess what? Donald Trump got in the White House and appointed some people to the Supreme Court. So, I, you know, you'd hope that Carl Truman would make some, uh, would say something about this. Say, look, I was wrong. I published that. I was wrong. But I don't expect that. Uh, th this is the kind of logic that I think you would get from a Karen Swallow Pryor. This is exactly the kind of logic David Platt put in um, Before You Vote. Uh, this is justifies, you know, vote Democrat, vote for the people who are pro-murder because, well... Uh, you know, they might be able to actually reduce the number of abortions or they, they actually might be better on other issues and the Republicans aren't going to do anything anyway. Now, in all this, I, I want to just point this out. I thought this was a, is a little thing he said, but I thought it was really important. Carl Truman says this about democracy. He says the nature of the democratic process itself imposes limits on radicalism. Elected politicians have various constituencies to whom they need to look. Now, that to me is where Carl Truman sees, I call it a mechanism for moderation, but that's where he sees 
in some sense, some hope. Democracy, that democracy is going to keep things accountable. Democracy is going to um, make sure that if something wrong happens, it's corrected. And I have no reason to believe that, uh, especially in 2022, when we just saw what just happened uh, in the last two years, two years ago, mostly. Uh, do you really want to trust that? You really think that mechanism is also beyond the pale? Perfect in every way that you can't have uh, stolen um, elections, potentially. I'm on YouTube, so I got to be careful here. I mean, th it's naive thinking on Carl Truman's part, it's just naive. And I think that's what a lot of, honestly, colors this whole thing. It's, it's just, it's, it's naive. H here's the thing I want to end with. It was understood, it was commonly understood at the time of the founding that in order to have a people who could steward a Republican uh, form of government, you would need to have virtue. And in order to have virtue, you would need to have religion. And the only religion that they were accustomed to having was a, was a form of Christianity. There were different forms of Christianity, but it was Christianity that held sway. Nine of the 13 colonies were basically, today they would consider them Christian theocracies, but they had state churches at the time of the founding. Uh, if you don't have that, if you don't have that mechanism for responsibility, religion, virtue, then democracy, now I'm saying a Republican form of government, that's what we have, we don't have a democracy really, but a, a form of government in which representatives are elected, in which the people have a say, becomes corrupted and the people no longer have a say. Totalitarianism is inevitable. Order must be made of all the chaos that's erupting as a result of people's irresponsibility. We are, we are living in the death of a republic right now. And I think, I don't know if Carl Truman, I, he, he seems to hint at that in the book at some, that America might be kind of in the twilight years, but, but why? Why is it in order to to have some of the things that some of these people champion so much, like democracy, as if that's going to save us or something? You have to have something undergirding it. You have to have virtue. And you have to have religion. And if you don't have that, then you there there's you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have quote unquote democracy or as I like to say a republican form of government. You just won't. And in order to have those things, then you need Christianity. And as Carl Truman, uh, who is a Christian, should know, then the best thing that we can do is, as much as we can, uh, not just evangelize and uh, make converts and disciples of, of Christ, but more than that, exert pol a Christian influence in politics. If you don't have that, how in the world do you think you're going to, you know, a religion that says lying's wrong and you'll be punished in the afterlife? Uh, even our, our national government understood this. The people in our national government in the founding era. That's why in our constitution, you have to take an oath. Why would you take an oath of office if there's no systems of rewards and punishments after this? Why? It makes no sense. Why not just break it? Lying's fine, I guess, right? Stealing's fine. What? No, those things aren't fine. <laughs> and, and, and as long as you justify them for some social justice cause, like, well, in order to get to equality or something, we got to do this thing. Um, there, there has to be, a, there has to be a sense of order. There has to be a a moral imperative that's fixed, in, and that people believe in and hold to, in order for there to be any civil order or societal order. You just can't have the two. Uh, you, you can't have one without the other. So, um, so th this is these are some of my thoughts on the book Republic Crap by Carl Truman. My my conclusion is that I think. He was blazing trails that he possibly didn't even know he was blazing in 2010. And we're reaping the rewards from them today. <laughs> and I don't know if this is, if Carl Truman's even, he believes in all the things that he said at that time. But um, I, and if someone knows something, I don't know, please send it to me. But I, I haven't been able to find anything that says he's retracted any of this stuff. And so... I wanted to bring this to you before I talk about rise and fall of, of uh, rise and triumph of the modern self, just because I think it is uh, somewhat of an important book to understand kind of uh, the philosophy that that Truman has, and uh, and you can see there, there's the uh, the elephant donkey, <laughs> the elephant donkey uh, that looks kind of weird on the front of his book, 
But uh, there you have it. Um, no personal anything, animosity, nothing uh, against Carl Truman whatsoever. In fact, I think some of his points are, are pretty good, like I said at the beginning. Uh, I just think that he is part of uh, a group of Christians who were, and perhaps still are, blazing this third way trail. That it's the, the Christianity transcends the political spectrum, or there's this in-between that Christians can believe in somehow that is the true Christian way. And we ought not be uh, discipled by, you know, as Ed Stetzer likes to say, all these Christians being discipled by Fox News. Uh, I don't think he, Ed Stetzer gets it. And I don't think Carl Truman quite understands either what common people are, how they're conceiving of some of these things. Uh, he makes some good points, but it seems like it's from, he's perched in the academy as he makes these points. All right. Uh, that's my critique. That's my um that's just those are my thoughts and maybe you think i'm wrong maybe i am wrong on some things you can put your uh your thought in the info or in the uh, comment section and i'll be happy to take a look and um hey i i have on a few occasions uh, i have retracted things so if you find something that i said that you think was wrong let me know god bless uh more coming and uh don't forget about the retreat info section go to the link there bye now